Stimulus-based multiple choice questions. You either love them or you hate them. <laughs> I'm kidding. Everybody hates them. They're confusing, they take too long, and they are a source of endless AP exam season anxiety, but they don't have to be. In this video, I'm going to help you understand how to approach these questions, and if you follow my advice, you will almost certainly improve. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well then let's get to it. Oh, and hey, I'm Steve Heimler, and I'm here to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. But you can't get a 5 on that exam without doing fairly well on those multiple choice questions, which make up about 40% of your score so let's figure it out. And everything I'm about to say applies to AP Euro, AP US, and AP World. First, let's talk about the timing. You'll have 55 of these questions, and you'll have 55 minutes to complete them, which if you carry the one and multiply by the sine wave is one minute per question. Now, I am going to make another video about these next week and how to get faster with them, but for now, all you need to understand is this. The people who make these tests know how long you have for this section. And that's important to remember because that means that they're not expecting you to spend hours poring over these documents and coming to a deep understanding about them. You've got to read them fairly quickly and just get the gist. And if that's what you're doing and you feel like you're doing it wrong, you're not. Like, that's all you have time for. Second, let's talk about order of operations, which is to say what is the first, second, and third thing you should do with every question. First, you need to read the question. And I know you're going to be tempted to read the stimulus first, but restrain thyself. If you read the question first, then you know what you need to look for in the stimulus, and that will save you time. Second, read the attribution. This little line right here is not a throwaway text. It's going to give you some really valuable information information, including the time period that you need to be thinking about and the people and the entities involved in the stimulus. And third, read the stimulus. And when you do, read it quickly, mark up whatever you think might help you answer the question that you've already read. Now that you've read and interpreted the stimulus, it's time to answer the question. You'll have four possible answers to choose from, and those answers will be one of three species. You're going to have two obviously wrong answers. And the reason that they're wrong is because they're in a different time period than the question is asking about, which is most common, or they're giving you a different historical thinking skill than the question is asking about, which is less common. What I mean is, if the question asks you about how events in the stimulus cause a change in something, then the obviously wrong answer could indicate a continuity, which is to say, you know, not a change. So that's the first species of wrong answer. The second species is called a distractor. This is an answer that is usually factually correct, but ultimately doesn't answer the question that they're asking. And last of all, you have the right answer. So the first thing you need to do is eliminate the two obviously wrong answers. And here's where I take a moment for a parenthetical remark. Like, I know that it's it's easy for me to say, eliminate the obviously wrong answers. Like, I've been teaching these courses for a long time, and the obviously wrong answers jump out to me immediately. But unless you have just flat out mastered the content of this course, what I say are the obviously wrong answers are not going to be so obvious to you. And so the remedy for that is twofold, and they both have to do with studying. First, let me emphasize yet again that there is no substitute for knowing the content of this course. Get those vocabulary words firmly stuffed in your brain folds, and that will go a long way. Second, you need to arrange those concepts in the time periods of the course. If you know what vocabulary goes in what period, then the obviously wrong answers will become more obvious because you'll know that they're trying to trick you with the wrong time period. Okay, parenthesis ended. Now, all that is strategy, and now I'm going to give you a few tactical tips for the multiple choice section in general. First, answer all the questions. Blank circles get no credit, but if you fill in a circle, hey, you know, you got a 25% chance of getting it right. Second, don't change your answer unless you are 100% sure that you put down the the wrong answer. I know that's scary, but just trust me here. Go with your gut, and that will serve you better than overthinking it. Plus, you don't have time to overthink it, so, you know, listen to your gut. It's the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, thanks, gut. Third, if you're not convinced of what I just said, then hear this. You don't have to do as well on these questions as you think to score a five. Now, the percentages change every year, and of course, there are three other sections of the exam to factor in, but in general, those students who score in the mid-70s on the multiple choice are on their way to a five. In wider high school world, 75 isn't something to shout from the rooftops, but in AP exam world, oh baby, you just won. Now, if you want to see me actually walk through multiple choice questions for AP world and A push, then click right over here. You can see all these tips in action and see how I think through them. So I'll catch you over there. Heimler out.